Welcome back to Eigen Designs, and today I'm really excited to bring you the Infinite Staircase Cutting Board. I'm going to be using some walnut and some maple to make a staircase pattern into probably my most favorite cutting board that I've ever made. While the cutting board may look complicated, it's actually pretty straightforward to build, and this is a good conversation starter and a great way to impress your friends with your woodworking skills. All right, let's go. Before I get too far into this video, I do want to mention that to do this board successfully, you really do need a jointer and a planer. If you don't have those tools, it's just going to be really hard to get tight glue ups through the three different glue ups that you have to do to make this board. So just want to put that out there as a preface to this video. To create this pattern, we need one inch by two inch strips of both walnut and maple. So I go to my table saw and begin cutting strips of both walnut and maple that are about an inch and a quarter. I'm leaving some additional materials that I can then take that additional material out using a jointer and a planer to make sure everything is square. I'm also ripping uh, strips that are 24 inches long, so I've got plenty of length to work with. With the boards cut, it's time to make the first of many trips to the jointer and then the planer. I run each of the boards through once just to make sure that the bottom side has a really nice flat edge, and then I let my planer do a lot of the work, removing the material to make sure that all the boards have even thickness. To create this pattern, we're going to need eight strips of walnut and eight strips of maple. And one of the nuances of this pattern is that the width has to be exactly uh, half of the height. So whenever you put two boards together, they form a square. That's what's going to allow you to create the staircase pattern in a later step. Once you finish your planer work, you should end up with 16 boards that look like this. And man, is that satisfying to look at. For the first glue up, we're going to be mating a walnut board with a maple board. Now, if you look closely, I'm only applying glue to the walnut board. So even though I'm clamping all these together at the same time, there's only mating pairs that are actually being glued together. This will help us create the right pattern in the next glue up. After leaving the boards and the clamps for about an hour, I come through with the straight edge just to get rid of all the excess glue. With most of the glue removed, I then lay out the boards, turning every other board on end to create the pattern that you see here. Now we're not quite ready for glue up. We're gonna take the boards through the planer and the joiner one more time, just to make sure there's no gaps in the seams between the boards prior to glue up. So similar to the last step, I run each set of boards through the jointer one time to put a nice fresh flat edge on the bottom. And then I run them through the planer to make sure that they're even thickness all throughout. Now you'll recall me mentioning in the first step as we were milling up the boards prior to the first glue up that the board's width was exactly half of the height. That's so when you take two boards and put them together, it forms a square. Now because we just jointed and planed two sides of these boards, they are no longer square. They're actually rectangular. So I don't show it in this video, but I repeated the exact same milling operation on the other two sides just to make sure that they were completely flush and square so that whenever you glue it up, it looks like this. 
For the second glue up, we're going to be arranging the boards in the desired pattern and then applying some tight bond three for the glue up. When applying the glue, I make sure that there's adequate coverage in every single corner and every edge of the board, but I'm not using a lot of excess glue. You don't need a lot of excess glue, you just need to make sure that you've got adequate coverage so there's no gaps in the seams after you finish the glue up. And if you're looking to replicate this board, here's the cross section of what the board pattern needs to look like. And check out that perfect glue squeeze out in between the seams. Little bit of glue consistently across each of the boards that are glued together. After letting the glue dry overnight, it was time to put my crosscut sled to work. I started by removing the wood from the clamps and then heading over to my table saw and using my crosscut sled to put a nice fresh edge on one side of the board. And then I began ripping strips that were about an inch and three quarters each. You'll notice me using my stop block on my crosscut sled to make sure that every board that was ripped was the exact same width. Once all the strips were cut, I then took them and laid them out on a table so that I can begin creating the staircase pattern. I do this by shifting every other board up just a little bit so that it intersects with the pattern on the next board. Now something that's interesting, while I was filming this section, I accidentally dropped one of the strips and it broke. Now I'm a mechanical engineer by background, so how things break fascinates me because it tells you a lot about the strength of the materials and also highlights where the weak point in the system is. And if you look closely, the failure did not occur along the glued seam. It actually, the failure occurred longitudinally alongside the grain, which makes sense because if you're going to split firewood, that's how you do it. You split it longitudinally with the grain, which splits it apart. So that tells you that the glued seam is stronger than the bond between the different layers of grain in the wood. And that helps answer the question, how strong is a glued seam? Now this is assuming that you're doing a edge grain to edge grain glue, not in grain to end grain, because that's a different scenario. This third and final glue up is where we'll create the staircase pattern. And attention to detail here is really important to ensure that the final product comes out aligned and replicates the pattern that we're looking for. And because we're gluing up in the other orientation, I'm having to use my longer 48 inch parallel clamps to fit all the boards in. But as I'm putting these together, I'm making sure that all the boards are lining up just perfectly. This is particularly important as you begin to apply pressure because sometimes the boards have a tendency to slide past one another. So apply pressure slowly, ensure that you've got good alignment, and continue the clamp up. There's a few more things we need to do to the board before we can apply some finish. The first thing is to go back to the crosscut sled and put a nice, fresh, clean edge on both sides of the glue up that we just had. The second step is to flatten the board. Now, this is an optional step. You can achieve this by sanding, or if you have a drum sander, you can run it through the drum sander. I have recently gotten a Onefinity CNC, and so what I'm doing here is just making a very light pass at about a uh, 16th of an inch just to take off the top layer to ensure that both sides are completely flat. And while I had my cutting board in the CNC, I decided to route in a couple of handles on the underside of the board. I cut it to about uh, three quarters of an inch, which should be enough to get your fingers underneath the board if you want to pick it up and move it around because it is quite heavy. Another thing I did while I had the CNC running was to route a juice groove. Now I've used jigs to create juice grooves in the past but the cnc makes this really really simple and if you look carefully i'm actually putting a little bit of a design in each of the corners just as an additional flare for the cutting board to sand this board i'm going to work my way up from 80 grit and then go to 120 and then I'll step up to 150 
and then I'll go to 180, and then I'll finish it with 220, and I'll water pop before the 220 grit to finish the board. I'm not gonna show all the different sanding steps here because that's kind of boring to watch, but it's important not to skip your grits as you're working your way through the sequence because you can end up spending a lot more time on the if you jump too high of a grit in a single step. So I find that you get a better result and you actually spend less time sanding if you step your way through the grit sequentially rather than trying to skip too high of a grid in a single pass. I also want to mention that I'm using some mesh sanding paper made by a company called Merca. I made the transition to this mesh style sanding paper about four months ago, and I haven't looked back. Because the sandpaper is porous, it allows a lot of the dust and debris that you're generating from the sanding process to be extracted away from the surface so that you don't have particles that sit on top of the board that create additional pigtails and swirls into your project. So I'll have a link to these in the description below if you want to check them out. I'll be putting a chamfered edge on this particular board. And to do this, I'm going to be using a fine grit sandpaper in my radial orbital sander and just moving it back and forth across that edge at a constant speed and a constant pressure. You can see by the pictures of the final product that it turns out really well and you don't run the same risk of having significant chip out like you would with a router or a block plane, which you're especially prone to with an ingrained cutting board. I'll be finishing this board with a combination of beeswax and mineral oil, which not only protects and conditions the board, but also brings out a lot of the rich natural colors of the walnut and the maple. It's also important to note that both of these materials are food safe, so it's safe to prepare food after applying a finish like this. If your board ever becomes dry to the touch or the color begins to fade, you can simply reapply this to make this board last for a very, very long time. So after three glue ups and more trips to the jointer than I can count, here's how the final product turned out. I am really happy with this because it's not only an interesting piece, but it looks really complicated when in actuality it's really not. There is some attention to detail in between each of the glue ups to make sure that your seams are tight. But besides that, it's a really intricate pattern that was relatively simple to achieve. Now there was some additional attention to detail to just up the craftsmanship on this board a little bit. It was flattened with the CNC, we carved in some handles on the underside, and we put a bit of a pattern in the juice group to make it a little bit more interesting. And those small details really contribute to an overall better product. That's going to be it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and I'll see you on the next one.